See You Now is a podcast highlighting the innovative and human-centered solutions that nurses are coming up with to solve for today's most challenging healthcare problems. Created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association and hosted by nurse economist and health tech specialist, Shauna Butler. Healthcare is the biggest labor sector in the country. Healthcare also has the biggest labor shortages. We have so much waste because we don't take our employees seriously and we don't respect them. There has to be a better way. There must be a better way to do this. We really have to think carefully about how we structure the workplace so that we are attuned to these deeply human needs that all of us need and want, but that the most recent generation is demanding sooner and start creating the kinds of workplace that we would have wanted to work in. That can actually be a fun challenge. Welcome to See You Now. I'm Shauna Butler. Anyone following the headlines or counting on our healthcare systems is well aware of the significant, urgent, and ongoing challenges facing healthcare. We're flooded daily with news about what's not working in healthcare. It's no secret the worsening nursing vacancies, understaffing, and career exits have serious implications for care quality, workforce morale and safety, patient experience and access to care, and the financial stability of our healthcare systems. Striking a more hopeful and helpful tone as we dive into 2023, See You Now is turning the spotlight on those taking action to learn what's needed, what is working and gaining traction, and what's building momentum. The investment in career advancement and training programs for nursing is a very big ROI, and it's usually a lot cheaper than turning over your workforce by 25% every year. The most progressive CNOs have really figured this out and have implemented so many programs to tackle this. Given the intensity and severity of the healthcare workforce crisis, we're taking a deep dive to better understand work cultures, mindsets, and programs that prioritize building a diverse, thriving, supported workforce where people and their careers flourish. In conversations with nurses and health system executives in the U.S. and across the globe, the stress, vacancy rates, workplace conditions, quality and safety of care are top of mind, with everyone desperate for immediate actions they can take to stem the loss of talented and highly skilled nurses, as well as ensure they're building cultures and careers that attract and inspire the current and incoming generations of healthcare professionals. Over a series of three episodes centered on redesigning work, we're exploring our relationships with work. We're learning what nurses are saying, seeking, and what they need to thrive in their careers. And we're checking in with nursing leaders and healthcare employers to hear how they are taking action and evolving. In our first of the Redesigning Work episodes, we poked at the broad questions and psychology of what people are seeking from their work, careers, and workplace, and learned from psychologist and motivation researcher David Yeager what business cultures and mindsets truly support a person's natural desire to do impactful work. In this second segment in the series, we're centering on the voice of nurses, and we learn from an entrepreneur and problem solver, finely attuned to the healthcare workforce, what nurses are experiencing and seeking in their work, lives, and career, how she's built a product, team, and company that's revolutionizing the career marketplace, and on a mission, to help healthcare professionals live better lives and help them find and do their best work. Let's dive in. My name is Imana Bouzaid. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Incredible Health. I'm an MD by background, but I've been in healthcare technology for the last 10 years of my career. And uh, we started Incredible Health about five years ago. We are the fastest growing venture-backed career marketplace for healthcare workers. And hospitals and health systems use our technology to hire nurses in permanent roles in less than 20 days. And we offer a whole range of free services and tools to nurses as well. Our vision is to help healthcare professionals live better lives. And the mission is to help them find and do their best work. 
I am such a fan when I saw Incredible Help. I reached out and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what healthcare has needed for so, so, so long. It's been overdue coming to the market. But I think part of it is we didn't have the technologies. We weren't thinking about healthcare workforces in the same way. And as much as healthcare is often thought of as an innovator, we haven't been in some areas really good at risk taking. So uh, I just want to say thank you and compliment you and tell you how much I really appreciate all the things that you're doing. So let's start out with a couple of really simple questions. What is Incredible Health? Yeah. What problem is it designed to solve? And how is Incredible Health solving it? Shauna, yeah, you've known us from the early days of our journey. <laughs> and our mission is to help healthcare professionals live better lives and find and do their best work. What that means is hospitals and health systems, they use our custom matching technology to hire high quality permanent nurses in less than 20 days, which is a lot shorter than the industry average, which is around 90 days right now. And there's an interview request being sent from the employers to the talent every 15 seconds now. Um, (laughs) And so there's a few unique things about, about incredible health in our career marketplace, which is technology enabled. First is that the employers apply to the talent instead of waiting for the talent to apply to them. Second, we've automated the screening of the talent. So we're checking things like licenses, certifications, so on before they're being presented to the employers. And then we also have built custom matching technology. So when an employer logs in, let's say they're looking for ICU nurses or OR nurses or whatever. They don't want to see 276 nurses. They need to see 14 or 15 that are the right fit. And the same thing if you're a nurse, let's say you're a highly sought after OR nurse, like you don't really want to hear from 100 employers. You want to hear from four or five. So it's a much more curated or personalized experience that's enabled with technology. The benefits of all this is that hiring that happens faster. For hospitals and health systems, we save them at least $2 million in premium or travel nurse costs every year. For nurses, they're seeing on average a 15% increase in salary, and one third of the nurses are able to relocate to a different location as well using our platform. We've raised almost $100 million for Incredible Health. The company is valued at $1.65 billion, which makes us the most valuable tech enabled career marketplace in healthcare uh, in the US today. And we started this company five years ago. So over the last five years, we really expanded. We work with over 600 hospitals across the country, uh, including large ones like HCA Healthcare and Kaiser Permanente. We work with academic medical centers too, like Johns Hopkins and Stanford and Cedar sinai and lots and lots of community hospitals as well, including Baylor Scott & White and Wellstar and, and many others. We're actually live in 27 states right now. Yeah. When I hear that, I, I go back through my memory and think, How many companies that have been focused on the nursing workforce have had that level of investment? I can't think of. Yeah, um, I'm not. I don't think there's been any. Yeah, with this this level. Yeah. So, part of my, you know, I ask what incredible health is. That's a great explanation. But what problem is it designed to solve? Yeah, this is a great question. So what is the problem? And and more directly, why do the investors invest? Right. Right. So. We have to understand the market first. So healthcare is the biggest labor sector in the country by number of workers. And it has been since 2018. It has the most number of workers. It has the most dollars spent on the workers compared to any other industry in the U.S. Healthcare also has the biggest labor shortages. So our demand for healthcare as a country continues to increase because our population is aging, which is putting more demand and more strain on our healthcare system. But we as a country, all of us collectively, have not done the best job of increasing the number of workers to keep up with that demand. And it's felt most acutely in nursing, but it certainly is affecting many other healthcare professions as well. So that is the underlying demographic trend that is happening. It is a trend that has started long before COVID. Of course, uh, the pandemic exacerbated this challenge because the pandemic was essentially a demand shock on the healthcare system. Yeah. Um, and which, which really negatively affected the workforces too. And it's also a trend that will continue long after the pandemic subsides too. That's the underlying market challenge that we have. Now us as for my co-founder and I, when we started this five years ago, we started to dig into given that market dynamic that's going on, the huge supply demand imbalance, everybody should be hired quickly, efficiently. Everything should be like smooth, right? (laughs) But when we dug into it, we realized that the tools, the technology, the processes for hiring in healthcare hasn't changed in over 20 years. Um, You know, we're relying on just posting a job and hope everything works out. 
That might work in an industry where there's lots of workers available. It does not work in an industry where there's a huge labor shortage. So that's why we're like, okay, there has to be a better way. There must be a better way to do this. It is interesting that we continue to use the exact same approach, which has never really worked all that well to begin with. And actually, this happened during the pandemic. We needed to have a workforce that was going out and administering immunizations. When that call to action came out, I got flooded with requests from all sorts of different companies who were putting together these vaccination workforces. But when I went to apply into all of these different systems, oh my gosh, Iman, it was a disaster. And you know what? I must have applied to 15 different groups and never heard back from half of them. The few that I did, it was such a cumbersome type of process. So yeah. You and hear you know that what? from nurses all the time, too. They, you hear all the time. Very experienced nurses saying, I applied to 10, 15 places. Yeah. I didn't even hear back. Yeah. And the other interesting part is that happened 10 years ago in my career. It yeah. happened at the very beginning of my career. And I've been at this for 30 years. You're using a set of tools and technology that are really new for solving this. What are some of the technologies? I mean, when you talk about using algorithms, machine learning, custom matching, what are the technologies that are involved with helping to personalize and streamline the process of matching employer with talent? Yeah, so there's a whole stack of technology that we're using to enable the success here. I'll mention a few of them. First is like, you know, I, I mentioned the matching technology earlier, and that is that we now have a machine learning team and that is entering that realm now. And so it's like, what data or what signals can we use in different uh, nurse profiles, whether it's their backgrounds, their experiences, or what they're actually looking for? And how can we best match that to what the employers are looking for? And you'd think it was simple. <laughs> You know, CNOs often refer to us as the match.com of hospitals and nurses, you know, a little bit like a dating site. And it is a little bit like that. But because there are so many data points, there's now over 250 skills that we're collecting. There's 50 different specialty areas that we're, we're tackling. Plus, you add in the certifications, the geographies, the types of facilities they want to work out, etc. It, it turns out to be a pretty complex set of things that we have to match on. Um, I think the other technology piece that we've really taken advantage of is, is, is the mobile app and the ability to, to deliver free services and tools to nurses through the mobile app. You know, beyond the actual hiring marketplace of finding a permanent job, we offer free continuing education to every single nurse in the country, which is accredited in all 50 states, which they need to renew and activate their licenses. And we have free salary estimators available to them that they can narrow down by geography and by specialty. We even have a community for nurses built into our apps. It's a bit like a like a Quora for nurses where they can ask each other pretty detailed questions and get pretty amazing answers. Our idea from the talent services standpoint is to make sure that Incredible Health is a place where they're managing their career. It's not just the place where they're finding a permanent job. You know, nurses have a 30, 40 year long career and we, we want to make sure that they're using Incredible Health for other things like skill building, like salary information and community. Incredible Health right now has an incredible vantage point about nurses because you have so many on the platform. But when you think about and you're, you're listening to the nurses in America, what are you hearing and learning from them? As of November of 2022, we have uh, almost 600,000 nurses on our platform. So roughly that's about 12% of the U.S. nurse population. And that number grows several percentage points every month. Um, so when, when nurses are creating profiles on their platform, there are a set of questions that are being asked. And then in addition to that, we also do surveying. And so you're right in that we have a, a unique vantage point um, of to what, what it is that the nurses are looking for, what they want. The first topic I'll cover is just like, what are they looking for in their jobs or in their careers? And why is it that they're even leaving or looking for another job? The U.S. turnover for nursing right now is at 23%. It's the highest it's ever been in the history of U.S. healthcare. So it's like a billion dollar question. What's, why is that happening? By far, the number one reason why nurses are looking for a new role is they're looking for career advancement. Okay. And I'll go into each of these in detail. Number one is career advancement. Number two is flexible scheduling. Okay. Number three is something to do with geography. I'm relocating or I'm trying to shorten my commute time. And then number four is compensation. And it's in that order. That's the frequency of how often it comes up. You know, many hospital executives we speak with are very focused on the compensation piece, which to be clear, it, it, it's important. You got to keep up with the market and so on. But it is actually the fourth most common reason why nurses are looking for a job. It's not number one. So advancing your career might mean I'm trying to move into management or leadership, uh, or it could mean I'm trying to cross train into a different specialty. It could mean I'm a new graduate nurse and I'm trying to specialize in a particular unit. 
It can mean a whole range of topics, but they are looking to advance their career. Now, we are finding that the hospitals and health systems that are investing heavily in nurse career advancement have the lowest turnover rates. I'd love for you to to talk about this career planning, um, career mobility. The really enlightened leaders in healthcare, what are they doing and what impact is it having short and long term on their workforce and the careers of those individual nurses? What this looks like from a strategic standpoint, from the hospital perspective, it's investment in leadership training programs. It's documenting and identifying uh, the career mobility of a nurse once once they join your health system. And so it's very clear and documented. It includes things like cross-training programs, uh, adding nurses to governance committees, and all, all other types of committees. There's certainly new graduate programs, and we've seen an increase in the number of new graduate programs or the number of times a new graduate program is run in, in, in at a hospital or health system for more cross-training. You know, so let's say you are a labor and delivery nurse and you, your dream is to move into the OR, you know, enabling that, right? Uh, and having programming around that. Uh, and by the way, it's it's happening now because like market forces are forcing it to happen, essentially. Um, so Nothing like uh, a crisis. Honestly, a whole suite of things. And the most progressive CNOs have really figured this out and, and have implemented so many programs to tackle this. And to be honest, the investment in career advancement and training programs for nursing is a very big ROI, and it's usually a lot cheaper than turning over your workforce by 25% every year. And we can admit as a country and as a healthcare system that we have underinvested in career advancement for nursing historically. The, the, the second area I want to talk about is, is this, the second most common reason why nurses are leaving or looking for a new job is the desire for more flexible scheduling. The historical shift has been three days a week, 12 hour shifts, right? Many, many healthcare systems have implemented that. It's full time, three days a week, 12 hour shifts. That's it. That, that's your only option. And some nurses love it because it mm-hmm. means four days when you're not, you're not working, right? Yeah, and, they love and, their job for their time off. <laughs> exactly. So there's a desire from nurses, and this is we, we've surveyed every generation. There's five generations in the nursing workforce today, from Gen Z all the way to the boomers. Mm-hmm. The desire for more flexible scheduling is very pronounced among all the generations. And the way hospitals are reacting to this, and it is resulting in, in lower turnover, is they're offering a menu of options now. More part-time roles, eight-hour shift options, weekend scheduling, et cetera. And of course, presenting a whole menu of options to your nurses who are currently with you, as well as attracting those that are that you're trying to hire, um, is more operationally complex to manage internally. But it's something that we have to do because that is what the talent is looking for. I think the other part that might be missed in this discussion is when people are looking for flexibility, there's a certain degree of volition, you know, having control, having the respect, you know, and that really is when you think about you know, what a professional is, you have respect for their work and for their opinion. And flexibility is another really important way to build culture. It's a really important way to demonstrate respect, to also recognize the broad variations in the practice as well as the lives of those professionals. So flexibility is doing a lot of different things and making sure that we have more of it. Yeah, absolutely. Flexible scheduling, it represents your employer brand too. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it's saying that you're willing to accommodate them. Yeah. And, and just to be clear, this desire for flexible scheduling, it's like not, uh, it's not unique to nurses. I mean, even no. workers in other industries yeah. want like their flexibility. I mean, the way our country has evolved and so on, many of us are caring for older people. We're caring for young children. There's more demands on life. We do need more flexibility from our employers. And that's been a massive advantage to both the talent and the employers on our platform. So um, those are some of the things that you've been hearing, learning from clinicians. Um, You've got a lot of really exciting things that you're doing at Incredible Health that are acting upon what it is that you're hearing. Tell tell us about what those things are that you, you know, you've heard this, this, this set of insights. What are you guys doing to um, respond to them? Yeah, I mean, there's a whole, uh, a whole set of things. We really automated many aspects of the hiring workflow. Everything from sending out interview requests is now automatic, scheduling phone screens is automatic, trying to streamline as much as we can the operational excellence. The reason that's so critical is that we notice that in every single market where we operate, that it is the hospitals and health systems that move the fastest, that have the strongest hiring operations, the higher the most 
they hire even more than the hospitals that have the biggest brand in that market or the hospitals that have the highest salaries in that market. And we also know that 61% of the nurses accept the very first offer they receive. Say that again. 61% of nurses accept the very first offer they receive. Not the best uh, offer. Yeah. Not the, the best first offer. offer. Yeah. The first offer. Yeah. And even in situations where the nurse has multiple offers, the majority of those still accept the first offer because of it, it creates a very positive first impression. Also, nurses are working. I mean, they are overworked, right? So they don't have an enormous amount of time to dedicate to their job search. And so, yeah, the first, it's like first mover advantage. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So you get 600,000 nurses on your platform, 10,000 a month joining at this point? 12,000 a week joining. 12,000 yeah. a week. Given that you have this size advantage, you're working across all states, you're working in all sorts of different settings. What are the things that you're able to help in addressing and helping us to have having our workforce look a lot more like the communities that we're caring for? Yeah, I mean, one one area that we were able to really dig into is the area of human bias when it comes to hiring because of the advantage we have in terms of accessing so much data in the marketplace. One thing we noticed early in the history of Incredible Health is that we used to show the current location of the nurse, even if they're relocating, we show the cur- their current location. And we noticed that hospital recruiters were biasing against nurses that lived further away. And that's understandable. I mean, based on their 10, 20 years of recruiting experience, you have a better chance of hiring someone who lives closer than someone who lives further away. So what we ended up doing is just simply removing the current location of the nurse and that we remove that human bias. Mm. So those are examples of creative things that we're able to do in order to eliminate human bias. Mm -hmm. We also don't show the photos of nurses. I mean, it's optional for a nurse to upload their photo. Um, Otherwise, they can just choose an avatar, right? Right. Um, I I will say this, that I don't think we do a great job yet of tracking demographic data in our profiles in our marketplace, specifically around ethnicity data and future R&D investments will will be in that area. As we're thinking about developing careers. We've got to attract a lot of new folks into the workforce, as well as make sure that those who are here have careers that are thriving. So what's the algorithm for a thriving career? And how are those thriving careers going to be the attraction magnet for reaching early into somebody's career planning and saying, nursing is where you need to be. Healthcare is where you need to be. The way I like to break down this large problem is just by stage. Mm -hmm. So let's talk first about the applicants into nursing school. You're right. There are tens of thousands of applicants to nursing school that are just on a wait list. And our nursing schools cannot handle more capacity for several reasons. Either they don't have the facility or or frankly, they don't even have the faculty to handle more. Uh, And so that's one massive bottleneck that needs to get addressed. It's not that Americans do not have a desire to become healthcare workers. They do. But our ability to train them is not there and needs to you know, continue to build up. And, and we're seeing more investment in this area. We have health systems that are buying nursing schools. We have nursing schools that are expanding. We have future plans as well to address early nursing education too. The second bottleneck that's happening is after they graduate. So we have quite a lot of information about new graduate nurses. And 65% of new graduate nurses report feeling burnt out in their first six months. 55% already say that they don't plan on staying in the nursing profession until they retire. already report feeling overloaded and overwhelmed during the onboarding process. And 41% noted that on-the-job training was one of the most important aspects they evaluate when choosing an employer. So that means there's just like a lot of room for improvement in what's going on with new graduate training. Not just expanding the programs, but also improving the quality of the programs and providing much stronger training. And now that's hard to do, especially when you're losing your experienced nurses. And it's going to take all parties to help address it. Now, as far as what we're doing, we have plans to continue adding more, more programs that will help in the career management and career advancement of nurses. This last couple of years where we had so many people who were working from home. I mean, this has just been a huge revolution or evolution in our workforce, our workplaces, the technology that we're using, expectations of customers. You were recently named by Forbes magazine in their inaugural Future of Work 50. So this is a list highlighting executives, companies, thought leaders, innovators who are helping to shape How do we work in new ways? How do we work in new places? How do we reach millions of workers who have been impacted? When you look at that list of people who are on there, companies that they represent, workforces that they represent, 
What are some of the innovations that you're looking at saying, oh, we need to bring that into healthcare? Yeah, I mean, there's quite an impressive list (laughs) of companies and, and leaders. I think technologies and approaches that help support workers is where we we all need to go. The truth is we have underinvested in our healthcare workforce. Please don't assume I'm talking about compensation. Okay. That's like a separate topic altogether, right? Yeah. What I'm referring to is in their training, in their well-being, in the advancement of their careers. It's an in their in, safety. In, in, their, in, in their, their safety, safety, in their in their schedules, <laughs> you know, in their flexibility. And it has definitely caught up with us. And so any technology and approaches that addresses that is usually a recipe for success. Yeah. Well, specifically in that list, you know, the future of work 50, I don't know that there were many people there in healthcare, which says yeah. a lot. You, I think you were the only one that represented people who were innovating in healthcare. Going back to, it's one of our largest workforces. You know, if you just look at that statement that the top 50 that Forbes has identified as innovating in the workplace, there's only one, one representative there in the largest workforce that they are pointing to and saying, here's somebody who's thinking about the future of work. So on that list, was there anybody or company specifically that you looked at and said, oh, I like what they're doing. We could do that here. Yeah, yeah I've always been very uh, impressed with the company Better Up, which was on that list. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, they, they essentially provide a coaching marketplace for workers. Employers use their services and they provide the coaching to the employees. I've benefited from executive coaching myself. And the fact that BetterUp has really democratized that and brought coaching to, you know, all the middle managers, that's a massive and helpful advantage. Imagine if all nurse managers had access to that. Um, When you were thinking about this entire ecosystem, this entire life cycle, what do you think we need to be doing so that we are incentivizing, rewarding, you know, we've got more nurses in that nurse educator role. Yeah. I mean, I will share the tactics I've seen successful CNOs implement for this problem. And you're right. It's a very real problem. We do not have enough nurse educators. Part of the problem is we're also losing experienced nurses more than we've ever had. We are also just losing a lot of experienced nurses. So our ratio of new nurses to experienced nurses in hospitals is quite out of whack right now. And that, you know, and that creates training issues, it creates safety issues and so on. So some of the solutions that that we've seen implemented quite successfully include creating a nurse educator role that is essentially more pay for more flexibility. That nurse educator needs to flow or train in multiple units. That's one tactic that's been successful. Another tactic is really expanding flow pools. Essentially, what the employer is doing is offering more pay in exchange for flexibility. It means you will flow to multiple units or even multiple locations. And and you get exposed to more, which means you learn more quicker, right? Mm -hmm. And so really, uh, flow pools have multiple benefits to them. It's more flexibility. It's more pay. It's also, you know, it can really accelerate some aspects of training too. We also have seen nursing leaders implement rotation programs for nurse educators. So maybe you spend six months of the year as a nurse educator. And then six months of the year, you're on the floor. Uh, And then it's sort of like a a little bit more of a rotation program in case you don't want to do that all year. The topic is job design is becoming more and more important too, right? So what we're seeing is CNOs have acknowledged that the nurse managers have too much on their plate and they need more like essentially specialization for education, for training, for, you know, managing schedules, for managing the units, et cetera, uh, because it's just too much is being put on the nurse managers. Another thing that we've seen CNOs do is they really started to centralize education and training in single programs or a smaller set of programs, which is administered by the HR team, instead of having every unit have their own training. And that that way, you know, there's more shared resources and you can maintain the quality and so on. When I start talking about like sort of the broader innovation community in healthcare specifically, there's an enormous amount of focus on patient facing tools and services and lots of innovation and activity and investment and so on going on there. But we don't spend enough time looking at the back end stack of healthcare. Hiring is one of them. Training is another one. What's happening behind the scenes, not patient facing. What's going on behind the scenes that is creating an enormous amount of administrative cost 
and waste where there's an enormous amount of inefficiency, right? And frustration. And frustration. There's a whole range of, of opportunities there. And my hope is that there will be more entrepreneurs and leaders who focus more on the back end of healthcare, which is where honestly where the majority of cost is coming from. I'm an entrepreneur at heart, okay? And so I, I love entrepreneurship. I think it's one of the most amazing approaches to solving problems. And I think the reason I, I love it so much is like the impact that just a small group of people can have on an entire industry or an entire workforce or whatever it is, is massive. And so going in, into it with that lens, if you are an entrepreneur or just an innovative leader at a healthcare system, it's like when we are coming up with solutions, let's make sure, first of all, we identify the problem fully. And then when we come up with solutions, we actually really have to come up with something that's at least 10 times better than what's already out there. And that's hard. That is actually what it takes. You need that level of improvement in order to cut through all the noise and challenge of getting a solution adopted. And so that's really what I spent a lot of time thinking about. Like even now, when I think about product development here, like what is literally 10x better than what's already out there? That's what I'd encourage, you know, everybody to think about. And then secondly, and and I think this point really does get missed by many entrepreneurs and and other leaders is like, you got to have a strong ROI. You must have a strong return on investment. There must be a very strong business case for what you're recommending or for what your solution is. Yeah. And in thinking about culture, because so much of what you're asking or we, you know, is being asked of healthcare is a cultural shift. Where are you seeing organizations, health systems, leaders, what are they doing that's helping to bring about the cultural shift? We work with some really amazing leaders at Incredible Health. I'm I'm very grateful to be working with these, you know, 600 plus hospitals across the country because like scattered among all of them is several nursing leaders, HR leaders, COOs, CEOs, et cetera, that are really trying to move the ball forward. Those that have really acknowledged what the problem is, this isn't just about pay. This isn't just about travel agencies paying them more. This is about the desire for more career advancement or the desire for flexible scheduling. Those that have really understood the problem and are implementing programs and tactics to tackle, they're seeing the results. Now, it's hard, right? Because you're basically pushing against all this inertia, right? Like an organization of tens of thousands of people of decades, in some case, 100 plus years of history of doing things one way. It's very challenging, but it's those leaders that are really pushing it forward. And I would imagine, and you probably have the data to back this up, is that when this culture shift gets made, when there's the investment in careers, the institutional benefit means you do have careers that are flourishing. You do have people who have a long, very positive tenure there, that it becomes this virtuous cycle, I would imagine. Absolutely. And then the other thing is the collaboration between the leaders is critical. For example, the collaboration between the CNO and the CFO is probably one of the most underestimated collaborations out there. So, for example, when you are creating career advancement programs or when you're adding more flexible schedules, like, you know, flexible scheduling can also mean I'm expanding the float pool, creating my own travel agency internally, essentially paying nurses more in exchange for more flexibility. And many of these solutions need to be budget neutral. And they are budget neutral, but you have to work with your counterpart on the finance team. I mean, the one thing I'll just add is like, I'm hopeful for the future. Now more than ever, market forces are at play and leaders are paying attention. And more programs and strategies and tactics are being implemented because frankly, they have to be, right? Yeah. I've been running this company for five years now and it started before the pandemic. I will say that there has been a shift. You know, in our early, early years, we were speaking with HR leaders. Now we're speaking with HR leaders, plus the CEOs and the COOs and the CNOs. And like, the, just the attention from the C-suite on these problems that we've been covering throughout this episode are getting senior executive attention now because it is affecting the quality of care and it's affecting costs. Yeah. Um, I'm so grateful because I think you are... I feel like you are healthcare and nursing's greatest hope right now. No pressure. Oh, wow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, the truth is we, we haven't, I haven't done it alone. Got a great team. And then also just the, the uh, employers that we work with, there's, there's a lot of great executives out there that are really trying to drive change. And, and we have phenomenal nurses that we work with as well. Coming up next, we hear from nursing executives from around the country about how they are taking action and evolving to 
to empower nurses, advance their careers, and respond to the market demands and health needs of their communities. What would make a place somewhere where you would want to work? We have a lot of career mobility. I was thinking of Match.com, you know, the dating service, and this is like NursingMatch.com. We realized that in order to have a more diverse workforce, we needed to partner and we need to partner with academia. What we wanted to do was offer an opportunity where there was some growth. And so we set up the Nursing Informatics Liaison Program. There was a lot of nurses that said, this is a game changer. It makes your community healthier and it makes your community fiscally healthier when you have more people with jobs such as nursing. The nurses, they're young and they're smart and they're tech savvy. They need to have the opportunity to participate and design their own future in terms of how they provide care. It's an awesome program. Special thanks to our episode guest, CEO and co-founder of Incredible Health, Iman Abuzaid. A physician by training, an entrepreneur at heart. As CEO, she champions Incredible Health's mission of helping healthcare professionals live better lives and find and do their best work. Iman's immediate family has three surgeons, and as a doctor herself, she understands firsthand the urgency facing healthcare professionals, health systems, and the people and communities who count on them to care for them. It's what drives her to discover and build solutions that are 10x better, and we couldn't be more grateful. If you've not listened to our first episode in the series on redesigning work, do yourself a solid and check out episode 83 with psychologist and motivation researcher, David Yeager. For See You Now, I'm Shauna Butler. Keep listening. Nurses are transforming healthcare through innovation, compassion, and leadership. And Johnson & Johnson is proud to continue its 125 year commitment to champion nurses through recognition, skill building, leadership development, and more. The American Nurses Association is dedicated to building a culture of innovation. Nurses improve the lives of patients and communities through innovative thinking, empathetic connection, scientific rigor, and sheer determination. ANA is proud to support and advocate for our nation's most valuable healthcare resource, our nurses. For more information on See You Now and to listen to any of the earlier episodes in our library, visit seeyounowpodcast.com.